football, as in soccer, is a very physically demanding sport, combining speed, agility, and endurance capacity, along with the combination of both technically and physically demanding skills like kicking, jumping, and heading. Generally, at a professional level, teams may play two games a week, sometimes perhaps even three games a week. And so managing both the training stimuli with recovery is really critical to supporting these athletes. We're also managing a squad of often around about 25 players of, of which there is a real variety in terms of match play, in terms of game minutes. So we have to work out that balance between training and recovery across every player in our squad. I'm Joe Club, sports science consultant and founder of Global Performance Insights, which supports teams, athletes, and sports tech organizations around the world with sports science insights. Today, we're diving into some of the key sports science measures that we can look at in the sport of football. I want to thank Output Sports for their sponsorship, and we're going to be using examples from their technology and their software to illustrate some of these measures. So one capacity that is really critical for our soccer players is reactive strength. This physical capacity represents the body's ability to rapidly switch from an eccentric action to a concentric action. And that is a requirement of many of the movements, demands that we see in the sport, such as sprinting, jumping, changing direction. So the reactive strength index is a way of assessing an individual's reactive strength ability. The reactive strength index can be calculated by dividing jump height by ground contact time. We want to understand how much time in the air an athlete can generate with as little as possible ground contact time. Can they quickly absorb that eccentric demand of landing from a jump and transfer that then into this concentric propulsive uh, force that enables them to jump again? Now, there are a number of different ways that we can actually calculate RSI with our athlete. So we may use a simple drop jump off of a standardized box height, but we can also look at an incremental drop jump. Different box heights are used to see how an individual's plyometric abilities, how their RSI differs over these differing demands, because as we increase the box height, we make that a more challenging plyometric ability. I think we're also seeing more and more interest in just a simple rebound jump test. So there is no longer the need for having a box, but the individual carries out a counter movement jump followed immediately by a rebound jump. So this then still allows us to look at that ground contact time against the jump height in the rebound jump, but we're removing the need for a box. There is also the 10-5 testing option, which starts with a simple counter movement jump, immediately followed by 10 bilateral repeated hops. From that, the five best reps out of the 10 in terms of RSI score are averaged to give the individual their score. So we have a number of different testing options, which you can select from depending on the capabilities of your athletes, as well as perhaps the time allowance that you have for testing. In terms of benchmark data, Eamon Flanagan, in collaboration with Output Sports, proposed this normative data guide for RSI based on data available in the literature, along with his own experiences. We can use this as a starting point, but we do want to understand this with our own athlete and our population. So then if we have our RSI value, we have an outcome measure of our plyometric abilities within our athlete. And that can help guide our programming through the course of the season, particularly in those athletes who really could do with improving their fast stretch shortening cycle abilities. Another measure that matters in soccer is velocity. Now, I also talked about velocity-based training in another video in this series about American football, so NFL football. Velocity-based training can be a really useful approach in most team sports whereby we are trying to balance this training stimulus with the recovery needed. So traditional percentage-based training relies on fixed 1RM, but in reality, that capacity fluctuates daily. And so really we want to use what's called an auto-regulation approach where we are actually tweaking the intensity that we are asking the athlete to work at 
based on their capacity on that day. Velocity-based training quantifies lifting output by measuring the speed of the bar. This information allows us to understand the intensity at which the athlete is training. Because as the load increases, the concentric velocity of that movement decreases in an almost linear fashion. With output sports, for example, we get this real-time feedback which enables a few things. It can help drive intent in the weight room. Perhaps we have a leaderboard going to drive that competition between our athletes to see who can move the ball quickest. There's no need to mingle around here. Just, the TV's there. Go to the leaderboard. Nah, he's tired. Stop. Tired? Stop. Stop. You're tired. When I just set records. Don't worry, man. You want a little competition, I'll set records straight, you know. Don't worry. You two have got what? Three chances to try and beat me. Ah! Oh no. Quicker. Quicker. Okay, good, man. So, good I'm still. I'm more still. powerful, man. Yo, you're slowing down, if anything. Also, we can use it with this fixed load to understand where an individual is at on that day to then adjust the loads that they're going to lift in the subsequent session. So we might do this during a standardized warm-up set, for instance, and then we can adjust their training load to ensure that they're working at the appropriate intensity for what they need that day, whether that is we need to push harder, as might be the case with substitutes who haven't played, or perhaps dial it back to recover. But velocity-based training then gives us this objective measure to help guide our training approaches with our soccer players. Output would really form the backbone of our programming for athletes. The system's so user-friendly that players are able to operate the system themselves. Where it might have taken a number of hours in a group of 20 athletes, it can now be done within 45 to 60 minutes by one practitioner very, very easily. Analyzing the data has become a lot simpler for us. We're able to access the data right on field. The best thing about Outpost is you get simple data and you get it straight away. Now we know the importance of hamstring strength in soccer. It helps with both performance in terms of helping athletes with their sprinting, with their jumping, with their change of direction abilities, but also injury risk because all those demands are really taxing on the hamstring muscle group and as we know there is a common occurrence of hamstring muscle injury in this sport so we're also interested in trying to reduce the risk of injuries in that muscle group and one of the exercises that has gained a lot of attention is the nordic hamstring exercise as well as potentially being a useful exercise as part of a very multifaceted holistic hamstring prevention program this is useful for us because we can potentially take some measurements that give us insight into an individual's hamstring strength. One of the ways we can do this is using the Nordic breakpoint angle. We can capture this variable using either a IMU, like output sports, as well as perhaps motion analysis. So during this exercise, we tend to see a breakpoint at which the hamstrings maximize their eccentric strength in that position and a point at which they can no longer maintain that knee flexion moment and therefore the contraction breaks almost and the athlete quickly then the torso accelerates down to the ground and this study in footballers found a very large correlation between eccentric knee flexion strength measured via isokinetic dynamometry and the nordic breakpoint in that case measured via smartphone application so we can capture nordic breakpoint angle as a way of quickly, simply, and just in a portable manner of indirectly measuring an individual's eccentric hamstring strength. Another factor that may influence hamstring injury risk is the flexibility of the hamstring muscle groups. And one way to objectively measure this is through the passive straight leg raise test, which has previously been described as the gold standard for measuring hamstring flexibility. The study, for example, explored hamstring flexibility along with a range of other physical capacity in youth footballers. Based on their hamstring flexibility test outcomes, which was measured using this passive straight leg raise test, they then used K-means clustering to split the group into a low, 
and a high hamstring flexibility group. And then compared the physical capacities and found that there did seem to be a difference, admittedly not statistically significant in this case, but the high flexibility group did generally perform better as a group across the other physical measures that are really important in soccer. Now, this was a cross-sectional study, which means we can't know for certain that the better flexibility caused the better outcomes in other physical measures. It's just a snapshot in time, but it may be a measure that we want to assess, particularly in our pre-season battery and potentially track throughout the season. Here we can see an example of tracking the straight leg raise over the course of the season, but also the beauty of having data in one place through a system like Output Online Hub, whereby you can plot different metrics. In this case, we have both our hamstring flexibility and our hamstring strength measures plotted against each other. So we have a wide array of measures available to us in soccer. And today we have focused in on four particular measures that may matter in this sport to help guide our sport science support to soccer players. My thanks again to Output Sports for sponsoring this video as well as our whole series on measures that matter talking about the different measures and how they apply in different sporting content. Thank you for watching. I hope you found this video useful. If you did, please like and subscribe. And I'll be back again soon with another Sports Science Insights video.